Well, we all know that life is full of questions. Big questions, little questions, fun questions, and serious questions. Questions like, who's going to win the NCAA tournament? Right, March Madness, time of year when the whole world pays attention to college basketball. How many of you fell out of bracket? Oh, some of you, yeah, there's like millions of them filled out. How many of you had Loyola Chicago going to the Final Four? <laughs> oh, yeah, Fred, you're lying. Uh. <laughs> Did you see that they made a Sister Jean? Sister Jean is the 98-year-old uh, nun who's the chaplain of the team. They made a Sister Jean bobblehead. <laughs> I think it's awesome. I want to get a bobblehead of Sister Jean. Well, I fill out my bracket, you know, and, um, you know, I, I, I pay attention to sports and stuff, and I picked... I picked Arizona <laughs> to win the whole thing, and they got to beat the very first night, so there's that. <laughs> um, another question, is there intelligent life on in other planets? You know, some say, yes, must be. Some say, no, don't think so. Some say, maybe. I say, maybe the first step is finding intelligent life on this planet, <laughs> right? How does the internet work? How does the internet work? I did a Google search this week for the word donuts. And I got 133 million responses in 0.49 seconds. Who enters all that information on the internet? Where's the cloud anyway? It's just magic, I have no idea. Today we look at the first of two questions that we're gonna study this Easter season. The question we look at today comes from Jesus himself in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. By the time we get to this chapter, uh, Jesus uh, has been ministering publicly, teaching, healing for uh, two and a half years or a little bit more. He's healed the sick, he's fed the hungry, crowds are following him everywhere because everyone wants to get a glimpse of this new teacher, rabbi, prophet. They want to hear him teach and they're hoping to see a miracle. At the same time, about this point in the Gospels, we see that the religious leaders of the time are also becoming quite concerned because they see Jesus as a threat. They see him as a false teacher, a false prophet, who doesn't teach strict obedience to what they view as the law. And so they are already looking for ways and reasons to arrest him and get him off the scene. So that's the backdrop of this short interaction uh, we're going to read today. Jesus is very popular to some. He's unpopular with others and probably at least somewhat misunderstood by all. So Matthew chapter 16, I'm going to read through the story, comment a little bit to help you get your bearings, and then we're going to see what we have to learn today. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. That's only half a sentence in, but i got to stop here. Uh, we could easily miss this because we're not all that familiar with the geography of ancient Israel. Take a look at this map. Uh, you'll see the big body of water to the lower half is the Dead Sea. Uh, that's close to where Jerusalem is. Then the Jordan River runs all the way up, and you see the small body of water to the north. That's the Sea of Galilee. That's where Jesus' ministry was centered. But Caesarea Philippi is up about 30 miles northeast of the Sea of Galilee, so way to the north of Israel. Um, now, he has just finished feeding the 4,000 people in a miracle uh, near the Sea of Galilee. He takes his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi. Now this is surprising because this was a region known for pagan worship. There was a cave there uh, in an underground spring that fed the Jordan River. And the people of the region called that cave the Gates of Hades or the Gates of Hell. And the Greeks even built a temple there to the god Pan at that location. Now here's an image and you can see uh, on the right of the image, you see what it may have looked like back in Jesus' day with the Greek temples there to the pagan god Pan. Today, on the left, there's just an empty hole there that leads to this underground cavern. You can, so you can see why they might have called it the Gates of Hades. So, uh, picking it up, it says, He asked his disciples, who did the people say that the Son of Man is? 
Now, son of man sounds a bit strange to us. Like, what does that mean? But throughout the Old Testament, that's a title used for the coming Messiah of God. And it was one of Jesus' favorite ways to refer to himself. Verse 14, and they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Verse 20, Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, sometimes that last verse bothers people. Like, why would Jesus tell them to keep this a secret? Well, we see this several times in the Gospels. It just means that Jesus knew it was not quite yet time for him to declare himself because he knew once he did, everything was going to move very quickly to the cross. Okay, so we see two questions here in this story and two statements. And we begin with the first question, which is a religious question. It begins with a religious question. I found this little video on YouTube this past week. It's very short, but it's um, a series of interviews with just random people asking the question, who is Jesus? So take a look. Who do you believe the person of Jesus Christ to be? That's a tough question. He's the main guy for Christianity, I guess. He's cool. Jesus Christ. Who is he to you? He's just Jesus, man. I don't know. He's just, this is a cool guy, man. He's awesome. A carpenter from 2,000 years ago. A Jew, definitely, and yeah, he was a reformer, but I don't believe him to be the Messiah at all. Now, who do you believe Jesus Christ to be? Ooh, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I mean, I believe he existed, um, but I believe that he might have been like a rock star, like, you know, pretty cool, like maybe people thought he was super cool, but I don't believe in him as like a religious force. He's a person in history. That's all. It's a comfy story that probably makes people feel secure. Who do I believe Jesus Christ to be? Like, what kind of question is that? Who is, is, he, to, is he anything to you at all? Or what's your thought I mean, he's him? a religious figure. He uh, had, I mean, he obviously had a good message to send. I don't know if I, he's not my savior, but he's, he was a good guy, for sure. Jesus Christ to be. I think Jesus Christ pretty much is, um, who you believe yourself to be. I think Jesus Christ was a magician. I mean, he studied, you know, he studied in the Far East, kind of like David Blaine, but like he had way cooler tricks. He's a dead man um, who uh, had an enormous impact on the world, right? uh, said a lot of wise things, um, and uh, was the man of his time. Okay, people in our culture generally take one of three views when it comes to Jesus. First, uh, some take the view Jesus is a fictional character, kind of like we think of our comic book superheroes like Spider-Man or Captain America, uh, that he was imaginary. Now, this is a relatively small group in our culture, but some take that view. Most in our culture take the view that Jesus was a real historical person. You could see it on that video interview. A spiritual teacher, but really similar to people like Muhammad or Buddha or any other human being. And then the third group are people who would say Jesus is the eternal Son of God become flesh, who through his death and resurrection provides salvation and eternal life for all who believe. Basically three points of view. Jesus says here, Matthew 13, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, this region of pagan worship, he asked the disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is. So he takes his disciples to this unusual place, and he says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? He's saying, you guys have been around me for a couple of years now. I've been teaching, I've been healing, and I've done a few other miraculous things. So what's the word on the street? What are you hearing people say? Verse 14, and they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, Still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Now, from our perspective, we find ourselves going, well, those people did pretty much didn't go to Sunday school because those are wrong answers, right? They don't, they don't get it right. 
But we need to see that in that moment, at that time, the people who made those comparisons meant them as compliments about Jesus. These were all great, even heroic figures in Jewish religious history. John the Baptist was a fiery preacher of repentance, had a vast following, and had just recently been executed by Herod the Tetrarch. Elijah was the great prophet who confronted uh, the prophets of Baal in the Old Testament, called down fire from heaven, and many believed he would return to lead Israel. Jeremiah, the greatest of the latter prophets. So these people who say these things are acknowledging that Jesus was a man of God, a messenger sent from God. They're intended to be great and positive comparisons. It'd be like if today, somewhere, I ask one of you, hey, hey, you've, you've, you've heard me for a while. Who, who do people say that I sound like when I preach? And you would go, well, some people say Tim Keller. Some people say Andy Stanley. Some people say Jeff Frazier. <laughs> Those would be the answer's compliments. I'd be flattered, but it wouldn't be me. So some people like Jesus, they respect Jesus, but they're wrong about who he is. The main thing to see here is that it's possible to be interested in Jesus. It's possible to learn from what he had to say, but to completely miss who he is. Today's what we call Palm Sunday. It's a traditional day when Christians all over the world celebrate and remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The gospel writers tell us, and we read these verses moments ago, that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and he did so to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. In Zechariah, we read, See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, humble and riding on a donkey. And people lined the streets of Jerusalem, shouting and praising, Hosanna, Hosanna, the one who comes in the name of the Lord, because they believed Jesus might be the next king of Israel. They liked him. They liked his miracles. They liked what he had to say. They were fascinated with him, but they did not know who he was. In fact, less than a week later, less than a week later, another crowd gathered and shouted, crucify him, as Pilate sentenced him to die. All this to say, it's possible and it happens every week in churches all over North America. And I would guess it happens some even right here at this church. It's perfectly possible to come to a service, to sing some songs, to listen to a message, and to be very interested and to completely miss who Jesus is. Now, how can we know who Jesus was and who he is? What if I ask a different question? What if I ask, who is Theodore Roosevelt? Teddy Roosevelt died in 1919. So I'm pretty sure no one here actually knew him. But we could do the research, right? We could dig into the historical records. We could look for records of his birth, of his death. We could look for details about his life and accomplishments. We would find people who did know Teddy Roosevelt and listened to him and watched his life and who wrote down things about him. We would find out what he really did and if he really said the things that are attributed to him. Did he really say, for example, speak softly and carry a big stick? Did he really say, do what you can with what you have where you are? That's pretty good, by the way. Did he really once, and I forgot this story, did he really once get shot in the chest and then deliver a 90-minute speech before going to the hospital because he said no single bullet could take him down. Now that's a guy, right? We could find all that stuff out. We could learn lots of stuff. We could come up with a pretty good picture of Teddy Roosevelt. So it is with Jesus of Nazareth. Did you know that the earliest copies of the New Testament, what we have in our hands today, Parts of the Gospel of John date to about A.D. 125 or about 90 years after the death and resurrection of Christ or about 60 years after John wrote the original copies. Teddy Roosevelt died 100 years ago next year, and yet we can know the details of his life with relative certainty. In much the same way, we can know Jesus 
through the historical record of his life written by those who knew him. You could hear in that video, there are so many people, even in our modern culture, educated, who have no idea that this is a historical record of a person that we can know as well as we can know Teddy Roosevelt. The point is this, Jesus is not an imaginary figure of religious mythology. Jesus is not a kind of religious Rorschach blot that we can make whatever we want him to be. Jesus was a real person who lived in real history and said and did real things that eyewitnesses recorded, preserved, and copied that we can read and understand today. First question he asked was a general religious question. But then secondly, he asks a personal question. A personal question. Years ago, I was uh, taking a class in Christian education at a Christian college, and the first day of class, the professor stood up at a blackboard and wrote, before he did anything else, before he said anything, he wrote in big letters on the blackboard, Jesus is not the answer. And it got really quiet and awkward in the room because this was an era when people actually had on their bumper, uh, bumper stickers on their cars that said Jesus is the answer. This was a Christian college, a Christian professor, a Christian class, and people were like, Jesus is not the answer. And then he wrote on the board underneath that, Jesus is always the question, he wrote. What he was trying to say is that the truth of Jesus always demands a response. Verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? He asked the question a second time. This time, it's personal. Not who do people out there say I am. Who does the culture say that I am? But who do you say that I am? I picture this as being a little bit of an uncomfortable moment for those disciples. I I think of like a a math teacher uh, putting a complicated equation on the board and asking for a volunteer to come up and solve it in front of everybody. You know, crickets, nothing happens. The very way he asked the question kind of gives away that the previous answers didn't quite cut it. Okay, so that's what everyone else thinks. I want to know now, what do you think? I picture the disciples looking down, you know, scuffling their feet, hoping somebody else will raise their hand and answer first. I mean, what should they say? You know, John the Baptist, back from the dead, no. Nope. Not Elijah, not Jeremiah. If those don't get it done, what's left? What's the right answer? In his book, Mere Christianity, uh, C.S. Lewis, who I think you've heard of, presents what is sometimes called the trilemma. Not dilemma, but trilemma. That is, logically speaking, there are only three choices we can make when it comes to who Jesus is. And they're all mutually exclusive. He wasn't the first one to come up with this, but he's the one credited with making it the most clear. He says, Jesus was either exactly who he says he was, Son of God, Lord of all things, or he was a liar, a con man who intentionally misled his followers and led many of them straight to death. Or he was a lunatic. He was nuts. Like if you're in Chicago, you see a man standing on a park bench shouting and gesturing wildly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Lewis says it like this. I'm going to read this entire quote because it's worth hearing. He writes, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. That is, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. See, Jesus presents a problem. If he's just another prophet, then we can sort of set him aside as just another inspiring religious figure that we can learn from and, you know, kind of put on the shelf in the museum. 
But if Jesus is God, then everything changes. And the problem is the question, who do you say that I am? Because the question is intensely personal. Now we come to two statements. Those are the two questions. Now we come to two statements. The first statement I'm calling a confession of faith. A confession of faith. A few years ago, my brother told me an interesting story about a guy he had met in his church. And the guy told this story. When he was a young man, young lawyer, just graduated from law school, he got a job, thrilled to get a job, clerking for one of the most respected judges in all of the state of Ohio. The young attorney did everything he could early on to learn um, and uh, uh, earn the favor of the judge. And finally, he got up the courage to ask if he could have coffee with her to pick her brain and gain from her experience. And when he got to the coffee shop, uh, the judge was already there and was reading. And as he sat down, he said, "Uh, what are you reading? And she said, "Um, I'm reading my Bible. And the young man could not hide his surprise because he was not a believer. Uh, He had never read the Bible, considered it just religious mythology. And so the judge said, you look surprised. And the man said, yeah, well, I guess I'm just surprised someone as smart as you would be reading something like that. And then she said, well, tell me something then. What's your philosophy of life? He thought for a minute, was a little bit surprised by the question, then he mumbled something like, well, my philosophy of life is to work as hard as I can and have as much fun as I can. To which the judge said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, she said. (laughs) And that conversation jump-started his personal journey of faith and wound up with him putting his faith in Christ. Jesus asked a general religious question, who do people out there say that I am? Then he asks a personal question, who do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter is the one who answers. Verse 16, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, I, I love the character of Peter that comes to us in the New Testament. When Jesus came to them on the storm, in the storm, walking on the water, Peter was the first one out of the boat. When they came to arrest him in the garden, he was the first one to grab his sword and fight. Peter's the kid who raises his hand to answer every question in class. Oh, 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 pick me, pick me, right? And this time, he gets it dead on. Now, this is the first time in all of Scripture Jesus has been correctly identified by a human being. He says, he is, you are the Christ. That means anointed one. It's a title for the Messiah, son of the living God. Now, Peter did not yet fully understand what his confession even meant. He did not yet understand that the cross was coming. He did not yet know that the resurrection was coming after that. Yet he confessed his faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to be clear right here. No one becomes a Christian, a follower of Jesus, by being raised in a Christian family. You don't become a follower of Jesus, a Christian, by going to church. You don't become a Christian by being a really, really, really good moral person, the best person you can be. You become a Christian, the Bible says, by confessing faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we see this right here as Peter confesses his faith in Christ. That's the first statement. And then the second statement is what I call an eternal promise. Verse 17, and Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah. That simply means Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. (coughs) Excuse me. There are two promises here. First is, on this rock I will build my church. Remember, the church did not exist at this point. 
On this rock I will build my church, and secondly, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, on the first promise, uh, we see that's a source of a great, a great historical and theological divide throughout history. And it comes down to the interpretation of the word rock. All right? Verse 18, I, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What rock is Jesus talking about? Is he talking about Peter as the rock on which he will build his church? Or is he talking about the confession Peter has just made? You are the Christ, and on that rock he will build his church. And there's a big difference. In the Roman Catholic tradition, they put the emphasis on Peter as the rock which leads to the whole papal succession because in the Roman tradition, the Pope can speak the very words of God. It's on the Pope, on Peter, that the church is built. In the whole Protestant tradition, we see it as the rock as the confession that Peter has just made, the gospel. Christ is the foundation of the church. And we see some hint of this. Scholars believe that Jesus here is using a play on words because the name Peter is Petros, uh, which, which is, means a small pebble or small stone. And the word rock is petra, which means boulder or cliff. So that Jesus is saying, on you, Peter, the little stone, the little rock, uh, I, uh, I am building my church on the rock, the big rock, the boulder of the confession that you have just made. All that's complicated, but that's how we understand Jesus to be saying how he's going to build his church. And he says, on his church, on this rock, the church will be built and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, all kinds of images come into our mind regarding gates of hell. Uh, Jesus has taken his disciples to this pagan place. He might even be standing within sight of that cave and the, and, the, and the temple of Pan that was called the gates of hell. We're not exactly sure. It was a place of pagan worship. Uh, the phrase also in the Old Testament refers to uh, death itself. In, in Job chapter 38, we read, have the gates of death, same phraseology, gates of Hades, gates of death, been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? So the gates of hell, we believe, is a euphemism for physical and spiritual death. Peter and the others don't know it yet, but Jesus is only days, weeks away from the cross, and then only days away from the resurrection where he will defeat all of sin and death. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul himself writes, For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And finally, Jesus says, verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, what are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? In the ancient world, just like in our world today, keys are used to open and close doors. The doors of the kingdom of heaven, biblically speaking, the doors of salvation are opened through the death and resurrection of Christ. Therefore, the keys of the kingdom, we can assume, refers to the faithful presentation, preaching of the gospel. So when Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, he's telling Peter, promising Peter, that he will preach the gospel, the good news of forgiveness of sin, the good news of eternal life, that Christ has overcome all sin and death, and on that rock he will build his church and the gates of hell itself will not prevail against it. And we know from the rest of Scripture that just in a few weeks, Peter would actually deliver the very first Christian sermon on the very steps of the temple in Jerusalem, and thousands of people would put their faith in Christ. So I said earlier, today begins what Christians all over the world call Holy Week. We're going to gather here on Thursday and Friday evening to remember his death through a service of communion right here in this room. I hope you'll join us for that. It's a very special evening. Then over the weekend, next weekend, we'll remember and celebrate the resurrection of Christ in all our services. But what you need to hear today is the only thing that makes Easter more than a cultural celebration The only thing that makes this week more than spring break in our culture. The only thing that makes Easter more than a time for new dresses and chocolate bunnies. The only thing 
is the answer to the question, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that he is? Would you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the question that lies at the heart of the story that we studied, the question that lies at the center of all human history, the question that determines the eternal destiny of everyone in this room today. It's a question that's astonishingly simple, but overwhelmingly important. Who do you say that I am? Many of us have answered that question but maybe some here are uncertain. Simply would ask that by your spirit help each one to confess with Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It's in your name that we pray, amen.